Are you moved to act from a moral center of living? Are you moved to act when you see the world around you? If not, why not? I think that's what good artwork does to us. It prompts action. The, 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 the Quaker Podcast. Story, spirit, sound. I'm Georgia Sparling. And I'm John Watts. And it's time for a new vocal ministry episode. Great. I love doing these. Yes, the experiment continues. So do you want to remind the folks at home what these episodes are about? Sure. So vocal ministry is an important part of Quaker meeting, whether it's an unprogrammed meeting, a program meeting, or semi-programmed. Every Quaker meeting has a period of time where anyone can stand up and speak. Now, Quakerism is not a monolith. We all have different processes for composing these messages, but it's generally agreed on that we are trying to say something that was inspired by the Spirit. So with these vocal ministry episodes, which we're doing about once a month on the podcast, we really want to bring a range of Quaker voices, from the liberal unprogrammed to the evangelical and everything in between. Right. And even in the three, now four vocal ministry episodes that we've done, we've had a big range of faith practices and beliefs. We've had a sermon from Ashley Wilcox, who's a pastor at a semi-program meeting in Greensboro, North Carolina. We had a collection of essays from the unprogrammed Central Philadelphia monthly meeting. And then most recently, Craig freshly shared a message from his semi-program meeting. Right. And these episodes have generated a lot of discussion. It makes for some really engaging conversations on our episode pages and our social media, for sure. Yeah. And that's what we're hoping for with these episodes. Not that every listener will agree with every message that we publish, but we want to invite you to tune in in the spirit of worship, that we're giving it over to the speaker to be faithfully sharing what they've been given, even if that means sometimes that we're listening in tongues. Yeah, so let's keep that going with our first evangelical Quaker vocal minister. His name is Mark Kondo, and he pastors Reedwood Friends Church in Portland, Oregon. And Mark comes from an evangelical tradition in Ohio. Awesome. Yeah, I met Mark on my last trip to Portland. He's got a really great presence, and he struck me as a really thoughtful friend. I was so glad to hear that he was willing to come on the show to share this message with us. Yeah, me too. And the message that he's sharing with us today is the start of a sermon series that he's titled Songs That Preach, and he likens it to a mixtape that he's making for his congregation. Ooh, a mixtape. Yeah, as a, as a musician, I can really relate to how mixtapes can be an expression of the spirit, and also it, you know, is kind of nostalgic. That takes me back. <laughs> totally. Um, I think it's a really cool idea. Yeah, so how is Mark crafting this mixtape? How does that work with his church on Sunday mornings? Well, I'll let Mark explain that to us and also tell us more about himself and his congregation. Sounds like a plan. My name is Mark Kondo, and I am a minister at Reedwood Friends Church in Portland, Oregon. I had a pretty powerful uh, conversion slash convincement experience uh, when I was 18, and you know this this encounter with Christ, this encounter with God, you know, me made, made this really deep uh, impression on me. Uh, I really felt like I was awakened uh, to something, to some aspect of life that I was always uh, curious about, or uh, even had kind of existential dread about, and then upon realizing that it was friendly, that it was benevolent, I fell in love with it, you know? And that love was uh, over the course of years and learning and, and self-exploration. And, and then finally, I, uh, I was starting to get intimations of, okay, well, maybe this, is, maybe this is more than just a spiritual awakening. Maybe this is a vocation. Uh, I never intended to go into ministry <laughs> at all, you know. Um, we uh, moved cross country from Ohio uh, 
uh, where I was ministering there. Uh, I've been at Reedwood for uh, a little over four years now. It's a 130-year-old uh, Quaker meeting uh, that did not originally start at Reedwood. It started as First Friends Church there in Portland, Oregon. Ever since the pandemic, we have uh, both online and on-site uh, attenders. And it's a traditionally, you know, run programmed Quaker meeting. The membership at Reedwood really holds a high premium on like education and learning. Uh, learning as, uh, as an act of worship, learning as a spiritual experience. There's a process of exegeting the meeting you know, and what are the what are these families or what are these people perhaps going through and what are their questions and what are they looking for? You know, you just go for it. It has my my inspiration, it has to be something I'm interested in. It has to be something that is uh, um, can, you know, speak to me. How is this? Uh, section of the Bible, or this story from the Bible, or this poem. Uh, how is the? How are these things relatable and interconnected? I love connecting things, so that's that's a little bit of what I'm going to be doing. I want to connect stories within songs that have helped awaken my conscience to things that maybe I was numb to or blind to. So that was that's my sermon series for September. I'm calling it Songs That Preach. And we're gonna be visiting songs uh, that I've encountered throughout the years that have helped me along to become a more uh, human person. I don't listen to a lot of preaching. <laughs> you know, just, I, I have to find inspiration elsewhere and I, I find that inspiration in songs I listen to, very uh, uh, honest music, honest writing, uh, poetry, and of course, uh, the outdoors. You know, those are kind of like the sermons that I that I pay attention to. This week is going to be Lenny Kravitz's "Does Anybody Out There Even Care?" It's off his "Let Love Rule" album. In high school, a friend of mine kind of shared uh, some uh, you know albums with me. You know, back then it was probably a mixtape. <laughs> And there was a song, um, Does Anybody Out There Even Care? The song was stuck out to me because of how poignant it was uh, about stating uh, racial issues and the imagery that's in the lyrics uh, was, was very powerful uh, to me. And it was like a cup of cool water, you know, to me of, oh, here's someone talking about something and singing about something that um, for this <laughs> for this Midwest kid wouldn't really know where to begin you know so it was almost like a it was almost like a sermon to me um, even back then and that was you know kind of pre-convincement mark <laughs> you know but it was it was my heart was tender uh, to that and so that's why it kind of stuck with me. Even today, uh, I'll listen to what it says uh, because, yeah, it had that, that uh, emotional impact on me. After the break, Mark shares his Lenny Kravitz-inspired message. Hi, it's John here. Everyone has a different experience in waiting worship. For me, it's a time when ideas come to me, sometimes fully formed. When I was a songwriter, I would be sitting in the silence and have to run out of the room to grab a notebook and write down lyrics or song titles. Later, as a video producer, I would get ideas for videos that might go viral on YouTube. These days, when I sit in silence with other Quakers, project ideas come to me big things that I could never accomplish on my own. In 2020, I was sitting in worship and I was given the idea for a Quaker podcast, and not just any podcast, one that attempted to feature authentic Quaker ministries. 
I wrote it down in my notebook, but the logistics seemed overwhelming. I brought it to my meeting and we had a clearness committee. And now, three years later, I'm so excited to be speaking to you from that very podcast. A podcast that wouldn't be possible without the support and grounded vision of literally hundreds of friends. And we're featuring vocal ministry. I want you to just imagine the potential years from now of this repository of faithful Quaker messages from all over the world that we're building one episode at a time. And that's just one of the dreams that we are working on realizing here at The Quaker Project. But in order to do it, we need your help. I'd like to ask you to please consider joining those hundreds of friends who want to see this vision become a reality. Go to thequaker.org, that's T-H-E-E, quaker.org, and sign up to give 5 10 or even $20 a month toward making this ministry sustainable and supporting our work in giving Quakers a platform on 21st century media. Welcome back. We're now going to hear the first track of Mark Kondo's mixtape, a.k.a. his sermon, beginning with a scripture reading from a member of Reedwood Friends Church. Good morning. Our reading this morning is from Matthew 25, verses uh, 35 through 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? When was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. In the text we just heard, we can see how the early Christian community was invited into a new way of living. That's what it is. It's, it's really an invitation to live differently, to see differently, to behave differently in this world. Unique to this way of uh, of living was to have this openness to what some may call a continuing revelation. To live in such a way where you're expectant of something. You're looking for something. That is, faith is not a static set of rules that we maybe intellectually uh, accede to, but uh, rather faith is a dynamic lens whereby we encounter the world that we live in. That's what it is to kind of engage and embody this message. What's the question that this text is asking us? Where do we encounter the reality of God in life? Where do we kind of see and apprehend God and divinity? Where does it consistently manifest in this world and in our experience? Where is God active and moving in the world? Jesus' apocalyptic story then about the, what the conclusion of the age will be like asks the gathered human family a surprising and unexpected question by this cosmic vision of Christ. And the question is this, did you happen to see me while you were down there living life? <laughs> did you happen to see me? And did you know that you were supposed to be looking for me? <laughs> was that on the radar? Did you find out where I was hiding in plain sight? 
did you see me? Those designated in the text as the righteous answer back with some uh, trepidation. Um, uh, were we supposed to be looking for you? <laughs> Where were we supposed to be looking? And if you notice that Christ doesn't say your worship meetings in your churches, he doesn't say that. What does the text answer? It says, didn't you see me there among the hungry waiting to be fed? Didn't you see me where there was thirst waiting to be quenched? I was there among those waiting to be clothed and dignified. I was with the imprisoned waiting for liberation and for visitation. I was with those who were afflicted, sick and lonely, waiting to be seen and embraced. And to the righteous, he says, you did these things. You encountered me there. Aha. Here we have a good lead on where we encounter the presence of God. That presence of God that, is, uh, that seems to be elusive. It's almost shy, the presence of God. Where is it? Where do, we, where do we experience that? Where do we find that, we may ask? And Christ is saying that the divine riddle is answered when we serve and give our lives over to one another. And when we slow down and consider the deep needs of our neighbors and our neighborhoods, Christ is saying, you will find me there. To this point, in 1949, American writer, activist, and theologian Howard Thurman wrote a book entitled Jesus and the Disinherited, where he states the following. He writes, the masses of men and women live with their backs constantly against the wall. They are the poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed. So what does our religion say to them? The issue is not what it counsels them to do for others whose need may be greater, but what religion offers to meet their own needs. The search for an answer to this question is perhaps the most important religious quest of modern life. Jesus and the, and the Disinherited, Howard Thurman. So. My question would be, what helps us see what Thurman is writing about there? How do we kind of engage and interpret and see what Matthew 25 is talking about? It's one thing to acknowledge what is being said. It's another to have it embodied in, as a part of our actions and as a part of our faith journey. What does it mean then to arrive at these things? It's often unexpected, and seems accidental. What can awaken and stretch us in seeing life in a new way? In my high school friendships, and even, even the music that was passed around among us and that we listened to and, and shared uh, between one another, looking back and thinking back, this played a big role in helping me develop a broader and a more empathetic vision towards my neighbor, towards the world if not towards life itself. Starting way back there in the 90s, listening to songs and being around people that were asking bigger questions that had to do with the welfare of my neighbor, the welfare and the justice of society. There were songs that were self-aware enough to address painful social concerns, crucial at that time, and still remain so today, some 30 years later. In my teenage years, it was not so much the institutions of worship or institutions of public education where I learned about the ongoing sin of systemic racism. Honestly, it was listening to 70s and 80s punk rock music. How a genre of music addressed other realities of grave concern, such as sexism, abuses of government, the plight of US militarism, uh, colonization, even global ecological destruction. Those messages were in those songs I was listening to. 
Okay, so what does this have to do with what, <laughs> what we just heard and what we were just reading? When you look at the world around you, do you see? Are you moved to act from a moral center of living? It's asking. Are you moved to act when you see the world around you? If not, why not? I think that's what good artwork does to us. It prompts action, it prompts awareness, it prompts a sense, uh, a, a larger view of what's going on in the world. A little bit more about growing up in the 80s and the 90s, about this kind of subculture that I was in. Whenever you liked someone in the 80s and the 90s, you would make them a mixtape <laughs> of songs. <laughs> that were meaningful to you. This is a little bit of what I'm doing now. I want to share songs with my meeting that have spoken to me. I would like us to listen together to a song. The title of this song is itself a question. Does anybody out there even care? Performed by Lenny Kravitz. And this was released in 1989. And the song sets the question before its listeners are we complicit as we are witnesses to racial injustice and violence? Are we complicit? It's a song of protest. It's a song of not staying complicit. And so it was a brave and bold and a courageous song. What is my response to Lenny Kravitz's question? So this is song number one to my mixtape here to my Quaker meeting. Since it's a little pricey to license Lenny Kravitz's music, we asked a voice actor to read the lyrics to the song for us. We also have a link to the song in the show notes. The dream is lost. Don't let it slip away. For bloody days won't be far away. Because when there's no more sun, there's nowhere you can run. Does anybody know how many lives we've lost? Can anybody ever pay the cost? What will it take for us to join in peace, my friends? Does anybody out there even care? Wake up, world, before it's too late. It's time for love to conquer hate. And when the battle's won, we all can live as one. Riots in the streets men dressed in white sheets is that what we want a little boy hanging from a tree and a burning cross if we learn that we're one we can overcome before this takes us all we better catch ourselves before we fall does anybody know how many lives we've lost can anybody ever pay the cost what will it take for us to join in peace, my friends. Does anybody out there even care? Wake up, world, before it's too late. It's time for love to conquer hate. And when the battle's won, we all can live as one. What is our action? Social justice action is spirituality, according to, day, to today's scripture. I was fed, I was given drink, I was clothed, I was visited. You encountered me, the living Christ. Social justice is to be the primary concern of any religious practice, according to Howard Thurman. If there is religion being practiced, it must address the disinherited and the poor. It must help. It must be involved. Social, social justice is deeply needed still today. How can we be faithful in our response to stay involved with that which involves not just a few of us, not just a demographic, but all of us? How can we stay involved? 
how can we be faithful to that? That's the query. That's the question. That's what's brought to the fore. Let's see how this settles. Let's attend to the inward teaching of Christ. Let us attend to spirit. After Mark shared his message, I called him up for a debrief. This is a question kind of we've been asking everybody is like, how did it feel to give that message on Sunday? I was a little bit more self-aware than usual. This because of the nature and the goal, I guess, of what I wanted to do. I was trying something new. It was a risk on my part. And I thought, well, you know, let's take a risk. And and if you don't have that element of risk, you, you're probably doing yourself a disservice by not risking. So I'd rather risk, take a little mm-hmm. chance, and it's, and it's never going to come off as, as planned as you have in your imagination. And some things are better and some things are, well, I can improve upon that. So, and you just move on. Right. Well, what's something that came out better than you thought it might? I think the re- the way that people receive the song, uh, it's a rock song. And Reedwood is an older congregation. So it's like, all right, we're going to listen to some rock and roll. The feedback was never heard a Lenny Kravitz song <laughs> accompanying a, a sermon before, you know, uh, well done. And then, of course, other that sparked, you know, other people's imaginations. Someone was was mentioning uh, a Lauren Hill song that, that they were thinking of, and and I appreciated that. Um, one thing that you said during your sermon was something about basically good artwork prompts action, and so I'm wondering if you could unpack that a little bit. Hmm. <laughs> really, anything in the human experience can can become static. And there's something about the arts and something about things that speak to the condition of our heart, usually starting with where we are, not where we should be. You know, the arts have that that ability to kind of cut through the language barriers and they have this, you know, kind of creative way to make to make a path where we we may have stopped uh, stopped looking. You know, the the song itself may not give instruction or the artwork itself may not give instruction of what that action ought to be, but at least it, it will at least prime your imagination and prime your creativity in order to, to, to start thinking of new possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew 25, the um, 30, verse 35 through 40 is a tough one because it makes sort of everybody your neighbor (laughs) and it is the people that are maybe hardest often for a middle class upper middle class folks to interact with you know jesus says Mm -hmm. that's me so as you reflected on this passage how have you seen that in your own life like ways that you want to apply that or that you'd like to see your congregation interact with more that passage is really an apocalyptic uh passage you know it my, uh, you know, attraction to it and my identification with it is, okay, this expands and inflates our idea of what the incarnation is and how there's this kind of incarnational spirituality that Christianity is, is an incarnational spirituality where uh, really uh, everyone that we encounter, we can see our creator in. And how that's a powerful, that's a powerful thought. It, it kind of, it breaks down and dismantles kind of an us and them uh, type way of seeing our neighbors. You can't say them and claim to be uh, in union with your creator. I don't think I was... Uh, hoping for like an outcome of, okay, well, we need to do more in terms of, you know, Portland's homelessness population or uh, it was just kind of, it was a, it was a, it was just kind of a timely reminder within our neighbor. There is the one in whom we give our allegiance to spiritually speaking uh, and in a way that would be 
true to your calling. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us and for sharing your message, Mark. Thank you, Georgia. And it was a real pleasure to do so. Thank you for listening. And thank you to Mark Kondo for sharing his message with us. We did trim the sermon down for time with his permission, but you can visit our episode page to find a link to the full Sunday service. While you're there, you can also find a link to Lenny Kravitz's song, our discussion questions for this episode, and the transcript. This episode was produced by me, Georgia Sparling, and John Watts. John also wrote the music for this episode. Karimbe Lambie was our voice actor. The Quaker Podcast is part of The Quaker Project, a Quaker media organization with a focus on lifting up voices of spiritual courage and giving Quakers a platform in 21st century media. If you want to give to our work, we would so appreciate it. Please consider becoming a monthly supporter. You can learn more about how to join our giving team at thequaker.org. That's T-H-E-E quaker.org. Every contribution expands our capacity to tell Quaker stories in a fresh way. Before you go, I wanted to share a comment we received on Spotify about last week's episode with cozy mystery writer Edith Maxwell. Commenter Adrift writes, So excited. Last year, I started reading Maddie Day books. And if you haven't listened to last week's episode yet, that's Edith Maxwell's pen name. Anyway, Adrift says, That is how I discovered Quakerism. I've since been attending Pittsburgh Friends and feel I've found my spiritual home. Thanks, Edith. And thank you, Adrift, for your comment. If you have a minute, would you also leave a comment on either Spotify or Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice? And tell folks what you like about the show. It helps them figure out if it's something they want to listen to. If you're more inclined to share your thoughts via voicemail, why don't you give us a call? The number is 215-278-9411. And you just might hear yourself in this spot. Again, that number is 215-278-9411. Okay, we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.